Welcome back to the farm, everyone. Every single bin here at the main farm is full except for the south one. That's all we have left to load today. I don't think we're gonna load these two harvestors. We kind of built this new bin so we didn't have to use those anymore or feel obligated to use them. It'd be nice to put up a grain leg though so we don't have to move the auger around all the time. Chris and Jeff are dumping the semis back at the main farm. Dad and I are getting geared up to set an auger over here south of Lakeland College because we're gonna move here. I don't know if we'll get here today or not, but we might as well set the auger. Looks like Jeff's already filling the truck, so I get the first load off this morning. Dad's walking to the combine. We stopped in at the John Deere dealership. They believe that our X9 that had the steel rods ran through it should be complete within the next few hours. So we're gonna go ahead and pick a little bit with this one. And when they give us the call, we're gonna drop the head and then switch machines out because we'd rather have the machine that's ours and not have the one we're renting. It would be fun to keep running this 1100 model, but we maxed out the rental portion of our ingestion policy quite a few days ago. You all probably could have guessed this. The 1100 is just too much combine for us. It's too much combine for a 12 row head. You can drive faster than what is reasonably comfortable and supervisable as an operator. I don't even know if that's a word. But you get what I'm saying. I'm not even sure we ever pushed that combine over 70% capacity. We never ran out of power. We never ran out of cleaning capacity. We just don't have the trucks to keep that kind of grain away. Easily 7,000 bushels an hour, which Deer claims. And I think if you opened up the concave a little bit, really put the stick down, you could get closer to 8,000 out of that machine, which we never tried. It would need a 16 row head and you need a lot of trucks. What in the world? There's just straight up two dogs out here in the field. They're gone. See you later. Those dogs are just out there having the time of their lives. That's how I would feel if I wasn't chained to the grain cart every day. I think he's tired from running from the combine. Uh, maybe you shouldn't get in the cornfield, buddy. We're at least going to have to open up the next field with this combine. They said they gotta put some shields on ours and then run it outside, make sure everything's nice and snug before we can get it. There you have it, direct from Liebercart. That is DeKalb 6298 planted mid-May on one of our worst farms, 220 bushels an acre. I gave this reference in the previous video, this field of beans right here made 56. These two fields are by far our worst farms. Over the millennia as this soil was created, there's just been a lot of erosion, not a lot of organic matter or good topsoil on the farm. That corn making 220, especially because it's got a nice tree line and some deer feeding is pretty phenomenal. It's just mind numbing this year, seeing these lower productivity farms yield with or better than some of our better farms back around home because they were planted in May. That was the difference with how the weather worked out this summer. The immense heat, the drought, and then the following rains just came at a time where the earlier planted corn got a lot of stress when it did not need it, and the later planted corn got a little rain just in time to save the crop. So that's the difference we're seeing. I've never seen this farm yield within 30 bushels of some of those farms back home that are making 220 to 230. It's shocking, it makes you question your decisions, but that's the power of hindsight. If we'd known this was gonna happen, we would've waited till mid-May to plant everything. Usually April's the safe bet. Next year we're gonna plant corn in April. This doesn't really sway my opinion. Just one of those years where you fall on the short side of the statistics. Maybe it finally got cold enough for us to be able to come back and cut these green stem soybeans. I bet we still got four or five acres that we've had to leave. Last time we came out to try them, they were still too tough and too wet. It's been a week now. Maybe that's changed. We're about a mile south of Lakeland College, right next to Route 45. This is gonna be some May 4th planted Pioneer 14830. I think that the May stuff has an advantage. This is one of our best farms, and this will be where we find out. There's the other X9. Is that the end of the 1100 on our farm? Could be. And people drive like maniacs on this road.
back. Like it never left. Still set for cutting beans, feed accelerator, first gear, rotor, first gear. One new left rotor later, and she's back in action after two weeks, maybe. It doesn't get much easier than that. This is great. Every time I do this, you should have Well, normally you've got a corn head on. combines in action so we better go catch it looks like it's working so far because this combine is the next size down from the one we were renting we lose about 80 or 90 horsepower we do have the adjustable spout on our machine cloth seats in the cab unfortunately for the operator and we do have the big LSWs on it so we should be able to still get a lot done I mentioned that we weren't even really pushing the other machine, so this will be a more reasonable and efficient use of the combine. We made it an entire round and dad got an error for chopper speed zero. Looks like the chopper is plugged. I don't think corn stalks or corn leaves would plug a chopper. So there must be something going on. I don't know if it was the reassembly that's an issue or if there's an object in it. It's not usually just sunshine and roses when you get your machine back after the degree of disassembly that's been done to it. I'm gonna go ahead and load a partial truck just to keep things moving and dad's gonna investigate. It looks like dad and Katie are unplugging the chopper I just don't know that a chopper should plug in 14.5% corn. I've never heard of that. The knives are out. Ah, uh, something's got to be up. We're going to go ahead and try to run it. We've got it unjammed. I really don't know what to tell you guys because chopper's in high gear, knives are out, the corn's 14.5%. Most of the stuff's getting pulled through the corn head. The rest is going through the machine. It's not that much material. I can't imagine why it'd be plugging. Phil from Sloan showed up. Dad picked a few rounds and of course, nothing bad happened. Unless they're completely broken. Combines never misbehave when the mechanic's there. it's dry to put in the bin and not have to worry about storing it. I've had a lot of people give me a hard time about running one cart with the big combine. It's actually never an issue catching this one combine with one cart unless you're in extremely long passes through the field or you have to travel to get to the trucks to dump. We've got kind of a mix of both here. The corn's decent, the rows are relatively long and as opposed to getting the trucks out on the busy highway, I'm hauling across our bean field over to the trucks on the filter strip so the combine is waiting a little bit every time it is what it is got to balance safety and efficiency somehow and this is the best mix i can definitely see a world where you would need two grain carts for a big combine if you had incredible corn or really long passes or you're driving a long way to get to your trucks you would need two carts to keep the combine from stopping economically it probably actually makes more sense to let the combine stop as opposed to having a second cart a second tractor and a second driver on the clock at all times. I know it's no fun to let the combine sit, but that is probably actually cheaper than adding all that other extra equipment. Without a doubt, I already missed the unload speed of that Hallmaster grain cart we demoed yesterday and the adjustability of the spout is a nice perk. It would just be really nice to dump faster so I can get back to the combine after traveling through this other field. Dad picked up a rock over here on the north side of the field and now we're having a hard time getting the head to run. So we don't know if there's still a rock in here that we're not seeing. We got the first rock out and it still wouldn't run. It's spooky out this evening. 
Ah, another day, another dollar. Or maybe another day, another 70 cents if you account for inflation. We ran a little bit past sunset last night and then dad about hit a tree with his auger out. So we decided, you know what? Why don't we quit for the day before anything bad happens? Because that was almost very bad. Those incidents do occur. Sometimes you get tired or you don't realize something's in a certain position and you can cause a lot of damage. Not intentionally, just accidentally. Regardless, it all costs the same. That was bad timing on my part. He came to unload as I was doing the portion under the cart, and that's actually extremely loud when you're unloading the combine into the empty grain cart. There's just a lot of, a lot of noise. Greasing the grain cart's kind of like brushing your teeth. No one will know if you don't do it, but you will. And sometimes it can cost you in the long run. It's not exciting. It is necessary to take care of what you got though. There's a long list of things, in my opinion, that are technically optional. You don't have to grease your equipment if you don't want to, but you should. You could wear the same pair of underwear and socks every day, but you probably shouldn't. In both of those regards, if things start getting squeaky, you should probably take care of it. One aspect of that Hallmaster car we demoed a couple days ago I really liked was the accessibility of the service points. All of the grease cirques, I believe, were right around hip level. You don't have to crawl around, you don't have to crawl under the machine. Obviously, this is a single auger gravity-fed cart, so you gotta get to the drive shaft. I don't think that's a fair comparison. I'm in control for a little bit, opening up the ends on the next field. hitting something. Every time you let the grain cart guy in the combine, he messes something up. I didn't see a rock ball. or something in there. It sounds like it's in a feeder house. Got the service department out here with us this morning. Oh. Spider-Man himself. Oh no, I thought there was my goat. That thing's the Peter House chain has jumped. Oh, it on its own or Let's go get the other combine. Lenny, I hate to point out the obvious here, but there's a very strong correlation between our combine breaking and you showing up. I, I need to break up before the combine with me. Yep. I don't think that's gonna have enough tools to fix what we need. You got that figured out? Oh, look at that, you've got your bolt with a magnet. That's pretty neat. It, it, it's kind of more like a little gray one. Yeah. <laughs> Good ball. And, and that's a tin. That's a tin. We're finally giving in. Dad and Katie went to get the S670, put the eight row on. We're gonna pick old school here while Sloan's comes to fix whatever's wrong here. We don't think there's a rock in it, 
Dad thinks that the feeder house chain has actually jumped and that it's in some kind of a bind now. I stayed here at the field because Lenny's with me. I'm keeping an eye on him while his mom takes Graham to a routine visit at the doctor's office. He's helping supervise with me. I was kind of crawling around, look at things. I got something big. Oh wow, you caught a snout. That's, that's a huge catch. I got you. Yeah. I'm pulling the combine. You're pulling the whole combine? Lenny, it's hard to get anything done when we're always broke down. At least we got mini cookies. They're good? Amidst the chaos, here is the yield map from the field we just finished. May 4th planted Pioneer 14830 Chrome. It averaged 244 dry bushels per acre. A lot of it was 14%, so a little too dry, but perfect to put in the bin. The discrepancy I'm seeing here is a difference between low-lying dark soil, and then of course you've got your higher areas that need frequent rainfalls that did not get that. Overall, 244 is gonna be a, oh, well, oh, oh, it's going crazy. Overall, that's gonna be a really respectable yield for this year. There's probably actually some water damage down here that you just can't see, I'm sure. 244, Pioneer 14830, that'll be in our top four or five for the year, I bet. Mike from Sloan's is here looking at the X9. Dad's got the 670 getting geared up to pick corn with the eight row head. Mike says the feeder house chain looks like it's timed correctly. It's not jumped at all. So something else is banging around in there. It's almost poetic once again. X9 with like 350 separating hours, broken. S670 with 14, 1500 separator hours, running like a champ. There's nothing wrong with the head. We just took it off so they could access the feeder house easier. Mike checked over the feeder house. He said nothing's out of timing. What has happened is that this skirting right here, this piece that pivots back and forth with the front feeder house that gives it four and a half tilt, broke off on the other side and was just sitting up here banging around. That's what we were hearing. This is the main skirting that sits across there that moves as you move the feeder house. So there's not a big opening there. That actually looks a little bent, and then that one's missing part of the piece there. Right in here on the other side is where that piece right there is missing. It was just hanging in here, hitting the paddles. I think it may have plugged it initially and was making it not feed right. It probably would have ran, but I don't think it's correct. So they went to go rob it off of the other X9 that we just sent back, and they're gonna order a new one for ours again. I don't know why that would have broke. It did. In defense of the X9, its biggest breakdown was self-inflicted. So you can't really blame the machine for it being down for two weeks. It's been an hour or so. Mike from Sloan's is back working on that combine. He had some good news and some bad news. To put it simply, they don't have the parts we need. The other X9 has a different fitment because it doesn't have the feeder house dust fan. So what's on that one's not gonna work either. And he also said that same part is actually already broke off the other combine. It just didn't fall in the feeder house in a way where it was jamming things up. We're still harvesting here south of Lakeland. We're harvesting a new Pioneer corn hybrid. This is 13777. It's been doing fairly well in their plots, I believe, comparable to 14A30, which we just picked up the road. Excited to see how it yields on this farm. Standability looks good, good emergence, good population. We'll just have to see how the yield is when we're done. The yield map's gonna be all sorts of screwy because I don't even know how close that combine is to dialed in. And then that combine is fairly close. It seems to be a little low based on the last few fields. And if they both get running, the only way for me to really show you the yield map is after I go in on the John Deere Operation Center and do what's called a post calibration. So I can kind of match the yields up with each other to give you a consistent picture of how the combines are pulling in yield and what is getting outputted from the field. I'm continuing to hear consistent results showing that the May corn, particularly planted second to third week of May, is just torching the April corn, which goes against everything we've ever known. It's amazing and it really questions some of your decision making in the spring when the stuff planted in good conditions in April is 20, 30, maybe 40 bushels an acre worse than stuff planted in May. And usually the data indicates it should be the opposite. I guess you just need a crystal ball to be able to see when the rains are gonna fall and when the heat's gonna come. Most of the time, the April corn has the advantage. X9's rolling again. 
It's going to be an RIP to the trucking crew. Two trucks hauling a mile to a 13-inch auger, but man, there's going to be a lot of grain coming off this field. We may only finish this with both machines and then shut the other one down again. Grain cart's full. The other combine's going to be full immediately. Didn't take long. Like, literally, this is the first time I've caught the other combine. The trucks at least get a head start. They're both sitting here empty. Oh, yeah. Can't do this with one cart. X9's full now. Looks like it's about time to clean the windows again. I haven't done it in a week. You just can't do this with one cart. That one needs dumped. That one needs dumped. I just left to go fill the truck. I can't unload this cart fast enough to come back and catch them both. There's not a single thing I can do here. It's just not even possible for me to keep up. I'm guessing we won't run the second machine in the next field. It was just a temporary solution while the other one was broken down. Like Mr. Coyote's caught a meal, courtesy of us. I think he'll leave a tip. That's probably a rabbit. That does look like a rabbit. We're done with that one. We made about 246 dry bushels an acre. Pioneer 13 triple seven. A little bit of water damage, but a darn impressive hybrid there. Dad managed to grab the only possible tree limb on this farm. Oh, just drop it right down the decal. Nice. What do you mean there's foreign material in the sample? <laughs> I don't know where that would have come from. Oh, that's that for you. You gotta love them. I mean, there was still room on the cart on the other side of the field. I don't know why you didn't empty all the way out. I took off. You shut off your auger. Pull it down. Oh, yeah. You got room for another 10 bushel on there. Oh, don't turn downhill. Like a well-oiled machine. I'm guessing that my dad does somewhat enjoy the functionality of the bigger machine because it's doing the work of our two old machines. He can take off at certain times during the day and go work on managerial type stuff, whether that be keeping his records up to speed or taking a nap, it could be the same thing. I mean, the manager's gotta take a nap occasionally. Katie and I have been running here, two trucks. We're literally hauling right next door, keeping up just fine. Corn's decent. It's been easy going other than another technological issue. The corn head wouldn't unfold, go figure. Just had to recalibrate it. And I assume it's fixed or it may not be fixed. Sometimes things work even when they're not fixed. Can you say bye? Just tripped on a carcass on the ground. Hello. Are you obsessed with yourself? Wow! He fell on the skelly. Okay, bye bye. All right, can I have a high five? All right. I'll see you later. Your brother's still sleeping. <laughs> Silly goose. All right, see you later. Bye-bye. I'm early, yet I'm still late. Time mine's already running. Kick the tires. It's good. Can't be overloaded if it never goes on the road. Take that, DOT. I didn't exactly have that on my bingo card. A really late planted field of corn worked multiple times. We had to run the vertical till across it. 
because the hen bit and the chickweed were so bad. Yet the combination of the Pioneer 1136 and the DeKalb 11135 just set our record for the year to be beaten. 259, that's the best corn we've had. Sometime today we're gonna try to cut these remaining beans. We've got the other combine down here, the 30 foot draper. It's just a matter of the soybeans being ripe enough. There's still some green on them. It's amazing with water damage, how long they hold on to life and just don't mature correctly. Should be gone by the end of the day. If they're ready or not, they're going. The next field is just a half mile to the north, but it is completely different. A lot of variability out here. We've got some channel 21111, later planned like the last one. So other than the farm being a little bit more tricky and troublesome, it should have every opportunity to yield. While Dad's been opening up this cornfield, Katie's done all the legwork of getting the other combine switched over to beans, got the draper on it. Dad's gonna go try to cut those remaining beans. They're arguing about something important, I don't know. Hopefully they cut That'll be about 6% by now. They've been out there for four weeks without rain on them. If you take a look at exhibit A over there, corn head on the ground, draper on courtesy of Katie. And the last bin over here is almost full, maybe one or two more loads. So we're gonna have a lot of moving parts very shortly. Yeah, it's that time of day again. Saving the world one plastic container at a time. I had the same exact issue last year on this farm. It's set to soybeans over here, and we're picking corn. So I don't know if I go to fields. Go to fields, wrong one. I don't know why it's always this farm. Fields, select commodity, corn. The difference. Yep, it's a 300 bushel difference in weight. So I'm off. Hopefully I got the last field right. 72, corn. Looks like the bin's full. Augers lifted up. Okay, that corn does have good test weight. I just thought it was light because it was set to soybeans. That four pounds a bushel difference does add up pretty quickly. Lieber cart developers, if you are watching, I do have some feedback. Maybe this isn't possible. It would be interesting if you could switch the color of the display depending on what crop type you're in. So if you're in soybeans, maybe it's a yellow. And if you're in corn, it's a green. I don't know. Whatever customizable colors the operator would want to set, that would kind of help prevent the issue I just had. And it's my fault, not really your fault. That might prevent the issue I've had a few times of having the wrong crop type selected for some reason. It is definitely operator fault. It would just be an interesting little feedback mechanism to change the screen color based on crop type. It would also be kind of neat if you could punch in your cart capacity. So let's say this 1222 JNM can hold 1300 bushel of heavy corn and then have a progress bar in here. So would that even be remotely necessary? No, not at all. It would just be kind of neat. And we like neat things here. They don't have to be useful as long as they're entertaining. They're moving the drive over back home. We've got that 48 foot bin to fill. Jeff gave me a ride to my pickup because Katie and I are gonna be waiting. And then my uncle just went by with an auger, so they must be harvesting around here somewhere. The close and convenient ones down here are all full, so may slow us down a little bit. Corn's still yielding decently, can't complain. Look at these ornery little devils. Next year's henbit crop has already emerged. Gonna be fighting this for years to come. We're gonna have to spray. Tillage is a partial solution for controlling these winter annuals, but I really think the only solid management decision is to go ahead and spray them here in another three weeks or so late October, early November, that should help keep them down into next year. I really think that some of these clumps of winter annuals hurt our stand on a lot of our corn. We get some runts because of the planter units jumping out of the ground or the weeds getting incorporated into the seed trench. And ultimately that results in us not getting 100% correct even emergence. We're dropping 36,000 plants and we may only see a final stand of 31, 32, 33,000 if we're lucky because of all these clumps of weeds out in the field. It's something we got to address. That's one of my primary guesses as to why some of this later plant of corn like that field over there that made almost 260 yielded so well is it had a phenomenal stand. 
later planted corn gets better emergence because of the heat and we also did multiple tillage passes on it one with the vertical till to chop up the winter annuals like the hen bit and the chickweed resulting in a better stand a less diluted seed bed and i think it helped us so we got to do something different tillage is only partially effective got to have some herbicide in there katie and i are still picking corn to the north and it looks like dad is trying to cut those beans with s670 not a whole lot of dust for how long they've been out in the field. What are those beans testing then? Uh, 13%. Perfect. Just had to wait three weeks. Dad cutting soybeans completely handicaps us logistically because it ties up a truck and a driver. Because we're going to have to take those beans somewhere. We don't have any bins to put beans in right now. We're working on corn. Cleaning out the air filter on my tractor because it was getting a little grimy. Almost looks like I might need a new one. Dad's still chewing away on the beans. I went and got the grease gun. I'm gonna grease the X9 while we wait. Let the trucks catch up. Okay, you guys, just like that. Should about have these soybeans all cut over here. We stopped to grease the combine, just let the trucks catch up and grab a bite for lunch. We didn't go anywhere. We had some Subway, of course. Subway's getting kind of old at this point in the season. That's a great sign for this hybrid. The ears are still up. There's a hint of green in it. It finished strong. Probably go ahead and down. No, oh, too late. Gotta love that glacial meringue. Katie's in the combine today, I'm in the cart. We've been trying to figure out what went wrong with that auto steer on this field because this is not a straight row. I noticed it when I was spraying, and it's hilarious. Because it's straight down there, and then it starts to zigzag on the way up. Yet he got the whole field planted, so I've got no idea what went down. I don't know if he started drinking early this day or what. It's an interesting pattern. Oh, it's a little dusty. We finished harvesting that field across the interstate. It made about 227 dry. That field has some very challenging soil types, topography, and there's probably three or four acres, according to my dad, that are damaged long-term from old oil well salt pits. So you kind of have to factor that into the yield. We moved across the road to mostly the same hybrid, that channel 21111. Again, on a really poor farm here as well. This was one of our worst farms of soybeans last year. These fields making 220 to 230 really are in line with expectations. It's actually kind of amazing that these fields are yielding with or better than some of our April planted stuff around home that was on some of our arguably best farms. Just shows you how much of a difference planting date has made this year. Out of everything that's happened today, the best thing is that my beloved Fighting Illini are whooping the Michigan Wolverines in football right now. It looks like it's gonna end up on a win. That is barring a disaster. And disasters do happen sometimes. They happen on our farms occasionally. It's a good day though when the Illini win. Alrighty folks, I think I'm going to shut this video down for the evening. Harvest continues to grind away. It's turned from excitement to just a long drawn out process, but that's part of farming. Catch you on the next one. Appreciate you all tuning in. Peace!